All right, so this is a really cool interview with Felipe Ruiz, Deputy Lead Mechanical Engineer for the Parker Solar Probe. If you think about it, there's a lot going on on this spacecraft. And if you're going to integrate things in an airspace system, that is a technical management, uh, just like all kinds of challenge. I mean, this, like systems engineers and, and integrators, you can't really say it's not my job. You have to kind of own everything. And so if there's a mistake here that interacts with this, it's your problem. So it's a really fascinating job. So Felipe is uh, giving me this interview on the day that the Parker Solar Probe is supposed to launch. And so that's, uh, that's a big deal. I mean, to take time out of one of the biggest days in your career. So I'm very thankful. Thank you, Felipe. So enjoy this interview and I'll see you on the backside. The let's detail. just geek out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm used to like media that has no idea what this is. Yeah. So, like going. Forget all the media level. junk. Let's go to the engineer You're my place. people. You yeah. are my people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good. So so I know we have, do you call it the sun shield or the heat so shield? What do you call it? We call it the thermal protection system, the okay. TPS. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really what's letting us fly this mission. It's the reason why we haven't flown it in 60 years, because we hadn't come up with the right materials to do it. So the shield is a carbon-carbon foam. Sand is between two carbon carbon reinforced panels. So when you say carbon carbon foam, you're talking about the the matrix is carbon yeah. as well as the as the well as the face sheets. And I have a sample if you want to see it. You uh, can yeah. hold it and check it out. It's out there. Yeah, we'll look so at it in a second. We'll look at it in a second. Um, the white coating actually helps us reflect a lot of the heat coming in from the sun as well. And so when we're close to the sun, where we're in our last three orbits of the close approach, the top of the shield will see 1,300 degrees Celsius. It's about 11 inches, I'm sorry, 11 centimeters thick, and when you get to the bottom, you're at 300 degrees Celsius. So this is what I don't understand, because if mm -hmm. you have, let's say you got a boundary condition on one side of the TPS, thermal protection yes. system, right? So if I have a boundary condition on this side, that's 1300 degrees C, yep. okay? It, it, you know, you're gonna have heat transfer through that. Correct. Con conduction. Correct. Right, and so you're managing that but eventually on the other side, there's nowhere to dump that heat. Or are you trying, or is there some kind of radiation well, so, system? So there is. Um, You're dumping the heat to empty space. We are, there's a, so 1300C on top, 300C on bottom, and that 300C surface on the bottom of the shield gives us a radiative boundary condition going down to the rest of the spacecraft. That's something we can actually deal with. Uh, APL also built the Messenger spacecraft, which flew around Mercury. And for Messenger, we actually developed a lot of high temperature blankets, a lot of high temperature systems that can deal with a heat that big. So the top of the spacecraft will see about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And most of that is dealt with by these blankets up here. So do you have radiators? So we, we, we do, but the radiators are for the solar rays. Um, one of the really interesting challenges in this was figuring out how to power the spacecraft. Because we are going close to the sun, right? And so you have all of the solar flux you could ever want in the world. But, the but you, you could melt them. Right, so the moment you get an array out there, it's gone. <laughs> um, and that's another of the, the key enabling things we've done is these arrays, instead of being built on like a honeycomb panel, like usual satellite arrays are, we built them on a titanium platen that has micro channels flowing through it. With fluid. With we flow deionized water, and it's not fancy cool, it's just deionized water from a tank about this big inside the spacecraft that circulates here through the arrays, comes up to these two conical surfaces, and those are our radiators. And so that takes all the heat from the arrays and kicks it out to deep space. So you're the systems guy. I'm the kind of. I'm I'm the guy that put it all together. And so when we started this program 10 years ago, there was a lot of technology development that took place and a lot of people that specialized in how do I do just the TPS? How yes. do I do just the arrays? How do I do just the autonomy that it takes? So just and like any aerospace system, you have all these people that want more space, yep. they want more, want more weight, they want more, want more power. Yes. And so you're the guy that said, no, this is what you got. <laughs> or, you know, if they already had that system created, then you just worked on, out how to integrate it. Right. And so that's, that's what I, when I got involved in the program, we were about two years from starting integration and test, and we knew what piece parts were coming in, we knew what components were coming in, we had no idea how to put this together. Okay, so you've got this thermal protection system. Yes. Pointing at the sun. Mm -hmm. If you go off axis, so right here, like if the sun's over here, if this thing misaligns relative to the sun, then I start getting radiation uh, yes. heat input into the side of the air, uh, spacecraft, Stress, excuse right. me. So when that happens, stuff breaks, the mission's yeah. over. So how do you, are you using torque rods? Are you using reaction wheels? How are you pointing 
the spacecraft? Do you have a propellant budget for thrusters? Yep. What are you doing? So, so the spacecraft has four reaction wheels that we use for primary attitude control. So you we, got three in a backup? We got three in a backup. Okay. We don't use torque rods because we want to measure a lot of magnetic science around the sun and a torque rod would blow the instruments out of the water. And it's an interesting challenge going around the sun because one of the, the bigger challenges we had to deal with on the back side of the sun was that we get a radiative torque from the offset between the center of gravity of the spacecraft and the center of pressure of that shield. Okay, so you're saying there's solar pressure yeah. on the shield so because, it, because the center of uh, mass is not aligned with the center, center of pressure. Right. Oh, okay. So yeah. the, imagine if this was a oh, sail. Oh, dude, I usually, when I hear center pressure, I think aerodynamics. You're talking about, what's the word? It's not aerodynamics. It's, it would be uh, radiation something? Heliodynamics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of the same thing in an airplane, where if you're pushing with a fluid against the surface, you're going to get a center of pressure. We're pushing with the solar wind against our DPS. And that force acts at a moment on from the center of gravity, and so you get a torque. Um, we actually have to do momentum dumps around the backside of the sun when we're nearby because the torque is so high that we saturate the wheels. Yeah. And so there's phases in the mission where we're out of contact, we're doing primary science, we can only deviate by a couple of degrees, and we just saturate our momentum wheels, and now you got to fire thrusters to desaturate them. Okay, I see. So you, you fire the thrusters to, to gain that angular momentum budget back in the, yes. in the reaction wheels. Yeah, so what happens is the, the reaction wheels max out at a specific torque, which is their design limit, any faster than that, and you start risking a mechanical failure. And when we start getting close to that, we fire thrusters to create the opposite moment. And the wheels spin down as the thrusters fire. So spacecraft stays aligned because angular momentum is conserved, but now your wheels are spinning much slower, and turn off the thrusters, power up the wheel, or spin up the wheels again, and you keep going. Well, let me ask you this. You said you, said you couldn't use torque rods on the spacecraft mm -hmm. because that would blow your, uh, it, what is it? It's what, what's so the we device. Have, it's not a magnetometer. It is a magnetometer. Okay. It's a magnetometer there and there. Uh huh. So those are the same, and the two at a distance gives you more spatial resolution of the field, and there's a surgical magnetometer at the very end. But a reaction wheel works because of EMF as well, electromotive right. force. So how does a reaction wheel not blow the magnetometer out of the water, but a torque rod would? What's the difference So the there? torque rod has a much bigger magnetic dipole. Okay. And um, a torque rod is used more for terrestrial spacecraft, where we better understand the magnetic field. Specifically Earth, because they Specifically don't work Earth. on Mars. Right, and so you, you don't send a torque rod to Mars because there's no magnetic field. Um, we're trying to keep the spacecraft magnetically clean and not influence the measurements in any way because that's one of the really, really big science requirements we have. And um, reaction wheels having a small magnetic dipole, we were able to do that and you put the magnetometers far away. That's why we have a boom sticking out the back. I think I have one of those aha moments. Mm -hmm. So if it's a reaction wheel, then you are controlling the magnetic inputs oh, to the system yes. and you can, you can baseline the system. Mm -hmm. but, a rea but a torque rod depends on external magnetic forces Therefore, you don't, you can't baseline Correct. that out of the system. It's harder to take that out of the, me the science measurements and really just get the bare, the bare measurements you want to get for the. You taught me something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I could help a little bit. Um, rocket fuel. Oh yeah. What's your budget? Is so, that the question? Yeah. So you, you said you, you have to have a moment, momentum dump on the backside of the sun, mm -hmm. but you and so you have to fire your rockets. But how how long can you do that for? So we have a. 82 kilogram tank of hydrogen inside the spacecraft. So it's just like a blowdown monoprop? It's a blowdown monoprop. It's about this big. And I know because I was one of the guys holding it when we put it in the spacecraft. Was that cool? It was, yeah. There's been a lot of cool moments in that spacecraft. That was a cool one, but working on this is, I mean, there's moments so much better than that that you think back and it's like, and I'll tell you about some of them later. Um, we get almost all of our velocity from the launch vehicle. So we only use the, the propellant system for TCMs, trajectory correction maneuvers, and for momentum dumps. And uh, what was it? Momentum, momentum dumps. dumps. Okay. Um, the mission has an notional seven year lifetime. And so if this works correctly, mm -hmm. there's gonna be a Twitter account at NASA Sun or whatever it yeah. is. Is it, what is it, do you know? I think it's at NASA Sun. Okay, and so I'm gonna be, just like with Cassini, I follow yeah. that thing forever, I'm gonna be following <laughs> what is going on with Parker Solar yeah. Probe for years, right? Yes, 
seven years at least, and we're hoping at the end of seven years to still have fuel in the tanks, have a healthy spacecraft, and keep flying as long as we can. You know what would be awesome? If, if you had, every once in a while, you sent out like a tweet mm -hmm. that just showed me, just me, it would just be a tweet <laughs> just to me, just showed me how much of that monoprop was left. You know, like yeah, a bar, to, to see like a status down. bar, and it's like this is the gas tank on that, that spacecraft. Yeah. And we, so most, most of the longer burns are the TCMs early in the mission. So our first TCM is kind of our long burn. Um, after that, they get shorter and shorter as we're fine-tuning more our, our orbit or fine-tuning more our approach towards Venus for the gravity assist. The momentum dumps are really just thruster pulses. So you burn grams. Right. And so we're, we're hoping to have a big portion of that tank still full. That's awesome. The seven-year end when, of the mission. When you go into the sun. Yeah. Or are you actually going to Viking funeral this thing into the sun? <laughs> <laughs> so after many, many years, great science after what we hope are a lot of discoveries, we will eventually run out of fuel. And like I was chatting about, we have this issue where we're going to saturate our wheels because of the solar torque. We're going to lose the ability to control the spacecraft and uh, we'll expose things to the sun that aren't designed to be exposed to the sun. Again, thank you so much, Felipe, for the time. Um, that's a big deal, so thank you, especially on that day. Also, there's two other interviews on this channel you should check out. Number one is Dr. Angela Olento from the University of Chicago. Uh, she's the Dean of Physical Sciences. Super, super smart individual, and she educated me on the overall concept of the mission itself in the history and that's a really interesting interview because she's a peer of Dr. Eugene Parker. Also another interview with Dr. Tony Case, um, he worked on the Faraday Cup on the front of the spacecraft and I think it's actually supposed to be here on my model but anyway he explains how that works. It's fascinating. Anyway I'm, I'm thankful that you're here watching this video on the second channel. That means you're really interested in learning this stuff with me and uh, I'm grateful that you're here. Feel free to subscribe if you're into that sort of thing. If not, no big deal. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Bye.